days of content. You can go online on the Red Sea filmfestival.com and look up the programs under Souk and you'll get to see all of our different speakers. We have some really interesting people talking about co-productions and financing, even metaverse, soundtrack of our lives. Um, tomorrow there's also a session on opportunities in the Arab regions, which is really exciting. Uh, but right now we have Michael Uslan, who is the man who changed the landscape of the comic book genre as we know it. Um, so I'm going to welcome Michael to the stage, and he's going to do it in conversation. He's also the president at Brandon Entertainment. He's the originator and executive producer of the Batman movie franchise. So you're in for a real treat. Come on out, Michael. Hi. Hi thanks a lot. Good afternoon, everybody. The spirit of entrepreneurship, especially in our crazy industry, is ignited by passion, passion. When I was a kid, I discovered my passion. And my passion turned out to be comic books and superheroes. That was it for me. My mom said that I learned to read before I was four years old from comic books. I went to the first comic book convention ever held on the planet Earth. I was 13 years old. It was in a flea bag hotel in New York City. 200 of us showed up at the first Comic-Con. It was the first chance for comic book fans to actually meet face to face, or more accurately, pimple to pimple. Um, and it, it was magical. There were 197 boys who showed up and three girls. And we were absolutely astonished that three girls were there. Because when I was growing up, comic books weren't cool. There were no comic book movies. It wasn't considered a date night out. In fact, I would say when I was in high school and girls found out I was still 16 years old and reading and collecting comic books, I became what you might call date challenged. But that was the world that I grew up in. And by the time I was 18 years old and graduating from high school, I had amassed a collection of over 30,000 comic books dating back to 1936. My dad, when we moved into our house, could not get his car in the garage. There were just too many comic books there. So he built for me shelves from floor to ceiling around three walls of our garage. When that was filled up, we filled up the garage, and that was the end of my dad's car. Never once got in. So what do you do when you have this passion for superheroes? And when I was eight years old, I fell in love. I was the boy who loved Batman. I mean, I loved Superman, I loved the Hulk and Spider-Man, but Batman was different. And there were several reasons I became the boy who loved Batman. Number one, he's human. He has no superpowers. His greatest superpower, I contend, is his humanity. And as a kid, my God, I was able to so identify with him. In my heart of hearts, when I was eight years old, I believed I could be this guy. All I needed to do was study really hard, work out really hard, and get my dad to buy me a cool car. That was it. That was going to be all it would take. I dreamed of one day writing Batman comics and making Batman movies the way he was created in 1939 by Bill Finger and Bob Kane as a dark knight stalking deeply disturbed villains in the shadows. But how do you do that when you're a blue-collar kid from New Jersey, USA? My father was a stonemason, and my mom was a bookkeeper. I did not come from money. So I couldn't buy my way into Hollywood. I didn't know anybody in Hollywood. I had no relatives in Hollywood. So how do you jump the Grand Canyon? How, how do you get there from here? What I learned was how far passion can take you if you're willing to add two things to it, which we'll be talking about, commitment and perseverance. And as anybody who is in the movie or television industry knows, if you don't start with passion, if you're not prepared to make a commitment, if you're not ready to persevere as the days turn into months and the months turn into years on our projects, then you're finished before you start. So I needed to find any opportunity I had for a door that was open just a crack, and I could put my foot in and just 
get some kind of a start. Well, that happened to me by the time I got to college. I was a junior at Indiana University. It was the early 1970s, a time of great experimentation on United States college campuses, and that's all I'll say about that. But at that time, the campus began an experimental curriculum department in the College of Arts and Sciences, and this was the concept. If you had an idea for a college course that had never been taught before, and could get the backing of a department on campus, you had the right to appear before a panel of deans and professors and pitch your course. Even though I was just an undergrad, I was a junior in college, I thought, well, wait a minute. Nobody in the world has ever taught a college course on comic books and superheroes. So I went to the folklore department, found a wonderful professor who listened to me as I told him, the ancient gods of Greece and Egypt and Italy, they all still exist. Only today they wear spandex and capes. For example, the Greeks called him Poseidon. The Romans called him Neptune. I call him Aquaman. And he said, Michael, you're right. These are the same stories told, handed down in every culture about redemption, about brave heroes of the day fighting the demons and dragons of the day. And it really doesn't matter if we call them King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table or the Avengers. It's all still the same thing. I will back you. So armed with that, with a pile of comic books under my arm, I went in to pitch to the dean. I'm wearing a Spider-Man t-shirt. My hair's down to my shoulders. I walk in the door of this dark conference room, and there's the dean, and he's sitting at the end of the table. Did you ever see an older person who has a pair of little half glasses that they might wear at the end of their nose? He had one of those, and he looks down at me over his glasses and says, so you're the fellow who wants to teach a course on funny books at my university? I knew I was in deep trouble. I began the first pitch of my career. The dean let me speak for two minutes and cut me off. He said, Mr. Useland, stop. He said, come on, really? Comic book superheroes as contemporary mythology? Comic books as art? Give me a break. He says, Michael, I read comic books when I was a little boy. I read every issue of Superman I could. But all comic books are, are cheap entertainment for children, nothing more, nothing less, and I reject your theory. This was a life-changing moment for me. No different from some of the meetings I've been in pitching my projects. I could have bowed my head, picked up my comic books, and turned around and walked out of the room. But instead, feeling I had nothing left to lose, I stood my ground. And I said, Dean, may I ask you just two questions? He said, ask me anything you'd like. I said, Dean, are you familiar with the story of Moses? And he looked at me like I was crazy. He said, yeah, so? I said, so Dean, very, very briefly, would you just summarize for me the story of Moses? And he sat back in his chair, folded his arms, and said, Mr. Uslin, I don't know what game you're playing here, but I'll play this with you. He said, the Hebrew people were being persecuted. Their firstborn were being slain. A Hebrew couple placed their infant son in a little wicker basket and send him down the River Nile. There he's discovered by an Egyptian family who raised him as their own son. When he grew up and learned of his true heritage, he became a great hero to his people. I said, stop. Dean, that was great. Thank you very, very much. You said before you read Superman comics when you were a kid. Do you by any chance remember the origin of Superman? He said, of course. The planet Krypton was about to blow up. A scientist and his wife placed their infant son in a little rocket ship and send him to Earth. There he's discovered by the Kents, who raise him as their own son. When he grows up, and then the dean stops, stares at me for what I swear to you was an eternity, and says, Mr. Uslin, your course is accredited. <laughs> Holy moly, I am now the world's first college professor of comic books. I can't believe I pulled it off. I go back to my apartment. And of course, first thing I do is I call my mommy in New Jersey and I tell her what happened. I'm so excited. And she said, Michael, this is great. But remember, 
if you don't market yourself, if you don't market your creative ideas, no one will ever know about them. I said, Mom, I'm, I'm 19 years old. I have no money. I'm in Indiana in the middle of nowhere. What am I supposed to do? She said, you're a smart boy. You'll figure something out. So once again, figuring I had nothing to lose, I picked up a telephone. I called United Press International, which back then was as big a news syndicate as the Associated Press today. I asked to speak to a reporter. This gentleman got on the phone, and I proceeded to scream at him. I said, what is wrong with you? You're not doing your job. This is terrible. He said, excuse me. He goes, what are you talking about? I said, what, are you, what am I talking about? Are you kidding me? I just heard there's a course on comic books being taught at Indiana University. Are you telling me as a taxpayer in this state they are using my money to teach our children comic books? This is terrible. This is outrageous. This must be a communist plot to subvert the youth of America. And I slammed down the phone. It took this reporter three days to find out if there really was such a course and who was the lunatic teaching it. He showed up at my door with a photographer. That interview with photos was picked up by virtually every newspaper in North America, a whole bunch in Europe. My phone began to ring and never stopped. I was invited on radio talk shows. I was invited on TV talk shows. I never taught a single class where the room wasn't filled with television cameras and reporters. The NBC Nightly News, the CBS Evening News. It was a zoo. Two weeks go by and my phone rings. And it's this exuberant male voice. Hi, is this Mike Uslin? Yeah. Hiya, Mike. This is Stan Lee from Marvel Comics in New York City. I call this my burning bush moment. I was talking to my God. For ye uninitiated, Stan Lee was the co-creator of the entire pantheon of Marvel superheroes, Spider-Man, the Hulk, Black Panther, you name it. Stan said, Mike, everywhere I look, I'm seeing you on TV. I'm reading about you in newspapers. What you're doing is great for the whole comic book industry. How can I help you? At that moment, folks, Stan Lee turned from being my idol to my mentor. He then became my friend. And in the end, when he passed away, my son David and I were two of the producers of his memorial at Grauman's Chinese Theater in Hollywood. Two hours later, my phone rings again. Another male voice, Mr. Uslan. My name is Saul Harrison. I'm vice president of DC Comics in New York City. We've been listening to you on the radio, reading about you in magazines. He said, you're a very innovative young man. We would like to fly you to New York City and discuss ways we can work together. Oh my God, comic book geek, dream come true. I'm going to work for DC Comics. I would work there in the summers and then when I went back to school, to finish school at Indiana, they would put me on retainer. So I'm at DC Comics, it's my first week, I'm in New York City, it's so exciting. It's the end of the day, and I start to hear screaming from coming down the hallway where all the editor's offices are. It sounded like somebody was being murdered. I went running down there. It was a man named Denny O'Neill, a great writer, great editor, of a book called The Shadow. I don't know if many of you know The Shadow, but he was the direct influence on the creation of Batman, another dark, mysterious figure in pop culture history. And I said, Denny, are you all right? He said, no, I'm not all right. He said, um, the publisher had canceled The Shadow comic book, but then new sales figures came in and it spiked, so he reinstated it, which put it back on its old schedule for the printer, and that means I've got to have a completed script by tomorrow at 6 p.m. or else everything will be thrown off. I said, well, what's so upsetting about that? He said, Michael, I don't have a shadow script. I don't have a shadow story. I don't even have an idea for a shadow story. I said, Denny, I have an idea for a shadow story. He said, you do? I didn't. But so what? 
I saw that door open just a little crack, and I put my foot in it. He said, come in, come in, sit down. Tell me what your idea is for a shadow story. Oh, the wheels start turning. I go, well, you're going to love this, Denny, because it's really good. Um, you're going to love it. Um, I said, you know, my wife and I just came back from Niagara Falls, and we learned that back then, all the shadow stories were set in the 1930s and 1940s. Back then, in that time, people were going over Niagara Falls in barrels, and they were walking across on tightropes. I said, picture this, the shadow battling a bad guy on a tightrope over Niagara Falls at night with the searchlights going. He said, well, Michael, that's a great visual. That will make a great cover. But what is the story? I said, well, I'm just coming to that. The story, he says, what's it about? I said, it's about smuggling. And he said, okay, what are they smuggling? I said, well, they are smuggling drugs. He said, well, what is unique about it? What is the creative part of this? I said, well, Denny, I've been saving this for the last because this is the best part. Um, um, back then, they were going over the falls in barrels, false bottoms in the barrels. That's where they're putting the drugs. They're going over the Canadian falls, washing up onto the American side. That's how they're getting them through. He said, now that's creative. That's different. Can you have a full script on my desk by 6 o'clock tomorrow night? I said, not a problem. He says, go do it. I'm now a writer for DC Comics. I pull an all-nighter, right through the night, right on the bus going back to New York City. At 6 o'clock, I hand in my script. Two weeks later, I'm walking through the halls at DC, and who's coming toward me but the most important editor in the history of comics, Julie Schwartz. This is the man who not only returned Batman to his dark roots in comics, but he gave us Flash, Green Lantern, Justice League, this, and he was gruff. He was a gruff guy. Once you got to know him, he was kind of a marshmallow, but he was gruff. He saw me coming, long hair, my typical comic book t-shirt. He goes, hey, kid. I said, yes, Julie. I read your shadow script. I said, you did? He goes, yeah. It didn't stink. I go, oh, thank you. Thank you so very much. How'd you like to take a shot at writing Batman? I still get the chills. This dream I had since I was eight years old came true. I'm now writing Batman comics, and I'm still in college. Oh, my God. The day came when my first issue came out, and it, admittedly, amid all the tears, I panicked. Oh, my God, this dream I've had since I was eight years old, it, it's come true. I don't have a dream. I need a new dream. What's my new dream going to be? It took 10 minutes for the epiphany to strike. Because that's when I remembered a cold day in January 1966. I was a teenager. It was a night I had been waiting for for months. I was so excited. The Batman TV show was going to premiere on TV this night. I couldn't wait. I turned it on. And it started. And there's animation in the beginning. Oh, that's kind of cool. It kind of looks like Batman art. It's in color. Oh, somebody's spending a lot of money on the sets. Oh, the car is cool. 20 minutes in, it hit me. Oh, no, this is a comedy. They are playing Batman as a joke. The whole world is laughing at Batman, and that just killed me. So as a comic book geek, as a fan of Batman, that night in our basement den, I made a vow. I made a vow like young Bruce Wayne once made a vow except young Bruce Wayne made his vow over the slaughtered bodies of his parents in the street. My parents were safe upstairs in the kitchen. But I said, somehow, someday, some way, I am going to make Batman movies. Just like he was created as that dark knight battling these deeply disturbed villains. And I'm going to find a way to eliminate, erase from the collective consciousness of the world culture, these three awful new words, pow, zap, and wham. So now my time had come. I went back to the, to the man who mentored me into DC Comics. He was now the president of DC. And he was always very fatherly to me. And I said, Saul, I want to buy the rights to Batman and make dark and serious Batman movies. Did you ever see the poster to Home Alone? That's what his face looked like. He says, Michael, for God's sake, don't do this. 
Don't you understand, son? And whenever anyone calls me son, I know I'm in trouble. Don't you understand that since Batman went off the air on television, the brand is as dead as a dodo. Nobody's interested in Batman anymore. I don't want to see you lose your money. I go, yeah, but, but if we do dark and serious movies, nobody's ever done a comic book superhero movie like that before. This is going to be like a new form of entertainment. And he said, is there any way I can talk you out of this? I said, no. He said, all right, come on in. That began a six-month negotiation. It gave me, and I'm still just a kid in my 20s, folks. It gave me just enough time to raise money privately, find a partner who actually knew how to mount a production in, in, of a movie, and he was my dad's age. His name was Ben Melnicker. He was a legend in the industry. He had been executive vice president of MGM in their Tiffany years. Ben put together a few movies. You may have heard of Ben-Hur. Dr. Zhivago, 2001, A Space Odyssey, Gigi, and all those musicals. On October 3rd, 1979, we signed the contract, we paid the money, and I now acquired the rights to Batman. I quit my job. <laughs> it was one of my better ideas. I put Batman in my back pocket, and I flew out to Los Angeles. I said, this is going to be a breeze. Every movie studio is going to line up at my doorstep. How could they not see the potential for sequels, animation, merchandising? This is going to be easy. I was turned down by every single major studio in Hollywood, every mini major in Hollywood, and every major production company in Hollywood. I was told it was the worst idea they ever heard. I was told I was crazy. They said, Michael, come on. You can't do serious comic book movies. You can't do dark superheroes. You can't make a movie out of an old TV series. Nobody's ever done that before. Eventually, I wound up pitching at Columbia. And they had, the production executive had been there for decades, a dapper, silver-haired guy. And he knew Ben from the old days. And I pitched my heart out for my dark and serious Batman. And at the end, he looked at me with a tisk tisk and said, this is a terrible idea. Batman will never be a successful movie because our movie, Annie, hasn't done well. I said, wait a minute, Annie, are you talking about that little red-headed girl from Broadway who sings the song Tomorrow? He said, yeah. I go, well, for, what does that have to do with Batman? He said, oh, come on, Michael. They're both out of the funny pages. And that was my rejection. Then he turned to Ben and said, Ben, you and I go back a long ways. If you guys really want to make a Batman movie, we'll consider it. But it's got to be that funny pot-bellied guy from TV with the pow zaps and the whams. And I looked at him and I said, no. And with that, he pulled his chair and leaned into me and said, son, oh, there it is again, son, better to have a movie made than no movie at all. And I said, no. That was it. That was the last of the majors. Ben and I walk out of there. We're sitting on a bench on the studio lot. I am as depressed as, you, as a producer could possibly get. And Ben looked at me and he said, you know, Michael, isn't it ironic that the final no we received came from you? He said, you know what that makes you? I said, yeah, Ben, an idiot. He says, no, no, no. You have a vision for this. You have a vision that you believe honors the integrity of the creators and the character. And you are willing to sacrifice big money and a chance at a movie in order to protect and defend Batman. He said, Michael, you are Batman's Batman. He said, so pick yourself up. There's other international financing sources we can go to. There's other ways we can go, and let's get to it. And with that, he turned me around. We jumped off that bench and ultimately into movie history. From the time I bought the rights to Batman till the first Batman movie would come out, in 1989 with Michael Keaton and Jack Nicholson took 10 
years. Ten years. Let me tell you something. When you get ten years worth of rejection, of people telling you your idea is lousy, your work is bad, it tests your mettle as a human being. You've got to look deep inside yourself and say, okay, is everybody right and I'm just being stubborn? Or do I truly believe in this? Do I truly believe in myself? And I kept coming up with the latter answer. I did. And for 10 years, figuring out how to hold on by my fingertips, where my next dollar would come from. I now had a wife. I now had a son. I now had a house and a mortgage. 10 years. Finally, in 1986, a young genius by the name of Tim Burton came into our lives. When Tim Burton came in, he changed everything because he had what I always call the big idea. When I say it's a big idea, I'm not kidding. This is an idea that would not only change Hollywood, not only set up DC Comics for its movies, but open the door to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Because what Tim said was, if we're going to make the first truly serious comic book superhero movie, he says, Michael, this movie cannot be about Batman. What? This movie must be about Bruce Wayne. Ah. Oh. We have to make audiences believe in Bruce Wayne, that he is a man so driven, so obsessed, to the point of being psychotic, that he would get dressed up in a bat suit and go out and fight a guy who looks like the Joker. He goes, it's the only way we can do it without getting unintentional laughs from the audience. And as a corollary to the big idea, he said, from the opening frames of the movie, Gotham City must be the third most important character in this piece. We must get audiences to believe in Gotham City. Only then will they be able to suspend their disbelief and believe in Batman. And he was so right. Thanks to the added genius of my dear friend, he's no longer with us, Anton First, who was our production designer and would go on to win the Oscar for best production design. Anton got the script. And in Sam Hamm's brilliant script, there was only a line describing Gotham City. It said, Gotham City as if hell has erupted from underneath the earth. So Anton said to me, I didn't know what that meant. So he talked to Tim. He says, what does it mean? And Tim told him, I think it means New York City had there never been planning and zoning. Anton said, I get that. He goes off, researches conflicting styles of architecture, and then comes back with all the plans for Gotham City, the Batmobile, the whole look of the picture. And folks, I contend to you to this very day, to this very weekend, you go to any genre movie, any superhero movie, you can still see and feel the influence of Tim Burton's vision, of Anton First's design work, and even of Danny Elfman's magical notes. It's all there. And what do I mean that he opened the door to the Marvel Cinematic Universe? Think about it. Have you all seen an, any of the Iron Man movies? Shouldn't they really be entitled Tony Stark? Shouldn't the Spider-Man movies be entitled Peter Parker? It's the whole key. It was the whole key. After some time, it was important to find a filmmaker who could restore the darkness and dignity to Batman that had been. And I'm happy to say that a, another genius named Christopher Nolan came to take charge of the Batman franchise. And he was going to approach it with the same goal as Tim, but he was going to approach it 180 degrees different. What Tim did was he built Gotham City, five square city blocks on the back lot of Pinewood Studios. And Christopher Nolan said, I want to convince people that Batman could be real that this whole story, this place could be real. Because the times had changed, folks. This was now after 9-11. And everything was different. The world was no longer clearly black and white, good versus evil. It was gray. It was order versus chaos. And so Chris had a number of very big challenges in front of him. Number one, 
how does he convince you all that Bruce Wayne could be real? Well, through choosing Christian Bale, they were able to craft a performance that was brilliant and made us believe this could be a young man today with stress syndrome who goes off on a journey of self-discovery, a lost horizon type of journey. He made us believe in Bruce Wayne. He then made us believe in Gotham City because he didn't build it. Instead, he found his city, Chicago. Because if you take just two skyscrapers out of the skyline of Chicago, most people around the world will not know what city it was. If he had taken New York, the second you would have seen the Empire State Building, Times Square, you'd go, ah, it's New York City. It breaks the suspension of disbelief. So he nailed it. Next thing, how does he convince everybody that the Joker could be real? And that was through what I consider to be the performance of a lifetime by Heath Ledger, the Joker as a modern day terrorist, somebody who placed no value on human life whatsoever, not man, woman, child, or his own, and he scared us. He made the Joker feel real. And his biggest challenge of all, the biggest challenge of all, how does he make you believe that all this tech, all the gadgets could possibly be real? He hired Morgan Freeman to tell you they were real. And if Morgan Freeman says something's true, by God, it's true. So that's been one of the great things about Batman. Batman is a character who can continually be reinvented for a new generation. And you can have different actors playing Batman for different generations. You can have different creative visions of Batman, of Joker, by great and wonderful filmmakers from different points of view. Batman enables you to do that. One of the things I learned when The Dark Knight came out, I loved watching TV. And in America, we have our stations that are very right wing, and we have TV stations that are very left wing. And if you watched both, they each were claiming The Dark Knight was their guy. Batman transcends, transcends politics. You get to project your own perspectives on Batman. You get to project your own philosophies, your own politics on Batman, and interpret it that way as you go. It's something very, very rarely seen before. Well, let me take you back for a moment to 1989. The Batman movie was, our first Batman movie, was about to open. It was a magical time in New York City. You could not walk 25 steps through Times Square without seeing someone in a Batman t-shirt or wearing a Batman hat. It was impacting the culture, not simply the box office. And just before the movie opened, my phone rang in our office. It was the Annie guy from 10 years ago. The same guy who turned us down way back when. And he called and he said, Michael, I just want to congratulate you on the opening of Batman I know it's going to be a tremendous success. I always said you were a visionary. <laughs> so, epiphany. If you don't believe them when they tell you how bad you are and how awful your work is, and then if you don't believe them when they tell you how wonderful you are and how great all your work is, and just believe in yourself and believe in your project, you'll do just fine. Before we do questions and answers and start to get your questions together, I want to go back to the very beginning. I talked about the importance of passion, commitment, and perseverance. My dad, I said, was a stonemason. My father had to drop out of high school in New Jersey when he was 16 years old because of the depression. He had to go to work to help support his family to get them through. My father worked six days a week his entire life from age 16 to 80. He was an old world craftsman. He loved what he did. He got up before dawn every day, 
six days a week with a smile on his face because he couldn't wait to get to work. He was an artist. What he put together with concrete and marble and brick and stone, he was proud of. And when you grow up in a household like that, how can you not want that for yourself? To be able to wake up every Monday morning, even if it's a rainy Monday morning, and say, boy, I can't wait to get to work. That's a blessing. That's what my dad instilled in my brother and me. Follow your passion. Make it into your work. Be passionate about your work. If you can do that, you will never have a true day of work for the rest of your life. And he knew he had a geeky, strange, weird son, but he and my mom sacrificed everything to make sure I at least had the opportunity to have the education to try to pursue my own dreams. My mom, tough cookie. I went to a Little League baseball game, and I know baseball is not a big thing here at all, which is good because I struck out at every game. I was terrible as a kid, terrible. One day, the coach pulled together at the end of the game the three of us who struck out each time we went up to bat, got us just far enough away from where our parents were sitting and screamed in our faces. He said, you kids cost us the game. You kids look like clowns out there. You kids are horrible. Get out of my sight. That moment sent me to my treehouse in the, my backyard where I could lose myself in my world of comic books and superheroes. And of course, my mom showed up at the top step um, with a glass of chocolate milk and said, what's going on? What's the matter? And I told her. And she, I said, I'm never going back. I hate that guy. I'm never going back. I was crying my eyes out. She calmed me down. She says, Michael, you are going back. And I was so upset. She goes, listen to me. She goes, you made a commitment to your team. Your commitment was for this season, you would be at the practices, you would be at the games. You made a commitment, and we in our family honor our commitments. I know that might mean there's some pain involved, but sometimes you have to have some pain in order to be honorable and do what you are, or whatever is right to do. She said, you don't have to come back next year, but this year, you've got to go back. I will talk to your coach and straighten him out. And believe me, she straightened him out. Um, but it was my mother who instilled in my brother and me the need to never simply take no for an answer, to develop a high threshold for frustration. And we've all seen it. This industry operates on its own time. There, there is regular time, 24 hours of, in a day, seven days in a week. There is Michael time. Everyone who's ever worked for me knows about Michael time. Why wasn't this done yesterday? Why can't we do it today? And then there is what we call Hollywood time. Take the longest period of time you can possibly imagine for your project. Multiply it by four, and then add 20%. That's the world in which we all live. And that is the world we have to keep at and never lose our childhood sense of wonder. Never lose our passion. Always be prepared in the hardest of times to reaffirm our commitment and to grin and to persevere. And folks, if you all do that, you can do what I did. You can watch your dreams come true. Thank you very much. And now we have time for questions, Q&A. Absolutely, absolutely. Don't be shy, let's go. Uh, right here. Thank you so much. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for your time today. It was such an inspiring and beautiful story. Oh, thank you. Um, kind of like a superhero story, honestly. <laughs> so I wanted to ask, based on your experience as a writer and someone who's been in this industry, in this universe for so long, what makes a hero, villain, anti-hero, or this world story stand out? If there's not a source material, if a comic book hasn't existed prior, 
as a writer, how can I make my story stand out? Or as a performer, how can I make a performance stand out in a created universe? That is a sensational question. As I have traveled the world, whether in China, Thailand, Japan, Korea, uh, Egypt recently, um, my clarion call has always been this. To all the writers, to all the filmmakers out there, we have given you our superheroes. We have given you our stories. My country is only about 260 or 70 years old. We have a limited number of stories to tell. But in the cultures that I've seen around the world, there are thousands of years worth of stories. And it's about the culture, history, and mythology in each one. And, what's, and I said, you need to give us your superheroes. You need, to, you need to take your gods, your stories and mythologies, and modernize them and present them to us on a world stage before we saturate the whole marketplace. So then it comes down to pure storytelling. Hope and redemption are two themes that will never die. You have a chance through the use of superheroes or people like superheroes to talk about female empowerment, to talk about diversity. One of the greatest things that has happened to me is it's been my privilege to speak three times at the United Nations. And each time I've spoken there, we're with representatives from all of the Middle Eastern countries. And everybody had on the headsets. Everybody was speaking a different dialect or language. Each of us had different politics. Each of us had different cultures, worship different gods. And I didn't even know if everybody in the room had heard of Batman. But by the time the session ended, we found such a warm and fuzzy bond on the concept of comics and heroes and pop culture and movies and animation that stressed our similarities. Meanwhile, the media and a lot of the world politicians like to stress our differences. So we have a chance to, through storytelling, 